Okay, we got names. We're, we'll do names in a second. Let's learn more about this breed. Here. So uh, we have... Uh, I was going to do the DNA test already to see what she is. I was going to do the DNA test to see what she is, but she's sleeping, so I don't want to wake her up and like do this fucking swab. You know what I mean? This is a test for 350 breeds, types, and varieties, ancestry profile, and family tree. Back to great-grandparents. Find and connect with your pup's relatives. I don't know how the fuck they would do that. Like, this is a 23 and me, but for puppers. We're going to do that in a little bit. Um, the surf said that this was kind of shit, though. Oh, oh. Oh, my God. Just stretching. She just got a, you got a big stretch, dude. You got a big ass stretch in there. That isn't the 23 and me doggo edition. I think so. It's called Embark. I used Embark for my pity mix as a puppy. The physical stats and info they gave you ended up being insanely accurate at a year old. Wait, really? Don't do the DNA test. It will make it harder for her relatives to commit crimes without getting caught. I like how she doesn't sleep on the pillow at all. Yeah, so here's what's going on with that. Okay? Uh, if you're wondering why she's sleeping on the ground instead of on the pillow, I can tell you. It's because this is like a warm, uh, not a warm weather dog, but a cold weather dog. So she literally loves laying next to metal to just like get the, the coolness uh, off the ground. I mean, these are the types of dogs that you literally, as I showed you, uh, you, you keep outside all fucking day, every day. And they, they guard your flock. You know what uh, I mean? My adult male Dino. Here, this is, let's watch this fucking thing. This guy. Documentary like, TV. Producing the best breed documentary. Documentary TV. Welcome to my ranch here, and I want to introduce you to the breed and to my facility and help you better understand what the Tibetan Mastiff is all about. So come on, let's meet some of the dogs. I usually keep my dogs here in. Is that the best choice for California? Uh, no, I, I, I'm a ruthless piece of shit and I want, uh, my, I want whichever dog I have to suffer the most in my $3 million mansion, uh, that, uh, is, is uh, where the AC is always on. Um, you know, this dog is going to live a horrible life. And I, and I did that on purpose. I was specifically like, please, you know, I, I like to, I like my animals to suffer. I'm a cruel guy. But thank you, Chatter, Andy33K, for uh, informing everybody that you, you know, you know what's good. Sort of family packs, usually one male with several females, tends to keep the peace, especially during breeding season. You can keep males or females together in groups if they're not breeding dogs, but that's not the case here. So uh, we have uh, my adult male, Dino, with a year-old female in the back here, Golden Gaia year old female Talia and a four year old Dolly and sort of midday the Tibetan Mastiff often takes a nap they're alert uh, early evening through early morning and then for the day they sort of relax and chill out unless there's really something to bark about the Tibetan Mastiff is sort of the ultimate I feel like this guy loves Tibetan Mastiffs man <laughs> I mean wh what the fuck look at this bro he's got like the the copper painting. He's got statues. He's got pillows of him. Family guardian protection dog. Uh, their protection is instinctive. It's not a trained dog. The distinction is they are not an aggressor, but they are a defender. So in other words, as long as uh, everything is status quo around the house, around the yard, they're fine, like the lion laying up on the hill. But give them something to get upset about, they're right there standing at the guard at the gate ready to to defend or take it on they don't go look i haven't i i don't know what to do but like if she if she wants to like roam in the in the yard no this is the stand your ground dog i'm thinking about possibly 
I am thinking about possibly fucking uh, letting her roam at night outside. You know what I mean? And like have like a separate uh, sleeping area for her outside. Um, I haven't figured it out though. She gonna kill a yote? No, not where I live, brother. Um, I don't want her getting stolen. Uh, <laughs> this dog is 150 fucking pounds when she grows up. Um, I, I, you know, this is the one. I don't think this is the type of dog that motherfuckers are trying to steal. You know what I mean? This is also why the fuck would anybody try to steal like a mutt, like a 120 pound mutt? You know what I mean? Yeah, they steal fucking pugs and and French bulldogs and shit like that so they can like very quickly sell them. And also Hey, are you sure you've considered this years long decision you've made? I just did 40 seconds of googling and have concerns. <laughs> yeah. Like it'd be weird. It'd be weird to try and steal a fucking massive dog. Oh my god, look at her. Look at her kicking. Much. It's too much. It's shit. Oh. It's sleepy time. We are not paying attention to you. Hope you know that. Man, I am not expecting... I'm not even paying attention to anything. Does she smell good? I mean, she smells like a puppy, you know? She has the very distinct puppy scent where she smells like she's laid in piss a lot. And, and because I love her, it doesn't even fucking matter. You know what I mean? This is a puppy smell. Puppy smell. I said to myself as a tiny puppy and forgot Hassan's a giant. She is not tiny at all. She's already like around 10 pounds, I think. Uh, by one month, she's 5 to 10. Uh, two months, uh, 15 to 30 pounds. A female is 10 to, 20, uh, 10 to 25 pounds. And uh, she's like, uh, I think she's two months old. So pretty sure she's around 10 to 25 pounds. So uh, I don't know. By three months, they get up to 25 to 40. By four months, they get up to 40 to th uh, 45, 30 to 45. By five months, they, by six months, they get up to 40 to 60 pounds. So... Yeah, and they don't stop growing for two years. So big breeds, uh, big breeds are different where like this breed, from what I understand, uh, they, they literally keep growing for two years. Like they're supposed to stay on puppy food for two fucking years. You can get insulated dog doors installed in the exterior walls of your house. We'll see what. I have a new fee. She's about 145. Um, my brother's dog weighs more than me. I have to be careful when it's around. <coughs> I mean, she's going to be very, very well trained, so it doesn't matter. Got a Japanese Akita, and they keep growing until two years. Very stubborn breed, too. I mean, she's fucking stubborn, too. She takes a piss directly looking at me uh, in the face. She will literally, she will pee. She will get rewarded uh, for peeing in the right place. And then five minutes later, she will go up to the fucking pad and pee next to the pad. I assume because she missed or because she's a dick. I don't know. But you can see she peed on the pad correctly uh, right, right there. And this is like not even 24 hours in. So 
Um, she's doing great. Um, she's she's pissed and pooped. She's pooped more times uh, on the pad than not. So uh, obviously, eventually, uh, I will move to taking her outside to pee and poop outside. Are you going to consider getting one of those Mammoth Edition pickup trucks? Hard to imagine you and the dog fit in that tiny Porsche. Why not? I mean, she's uh, she's like a human size. If a human can fit in that Porsche, she can too. All giant dog breeds grow slower. That's why you need to be careful not to let them run up too many stairs or jump a lot until like 18 months. Pretty sure Hawk can pick up a 150-pound dog, especially if they engage in teamwork. Might want a second guess. Ever taking her outside, Sweaty? I think... <coughs> I think for we'll trouble, but they don't let trouble come to them. Sakura Gore, thank you for the 25. Get the subs. My name is... Like, that coat... Look, her coat is similar to that, what you just saw. This. She kind of looks like her a little bit. My name is Richard Eichhorn. Call me Rick. Um, I'm Draki Tibetan Mastiffs. I... Started in this breed in 1978 uh, when I saw a picture of them in a Life magazine on rare breed dogs of the world. I had a friend who had Tibetan Terriers. I called her and said, what's up with this Tibetan Mastiff? Uh, she introduced me to the woman who brought the first dogs into the country who lives, lived about an hour from where I am now. And I uh, got my first dog from her and that's about 20 generations ago. How was she in the car ride back? Oh, nothing. Um, she was super chill, but I think like guys, puppies until they're like six months old, like, especially in the first, like first two months, three months, they're still literally learning to see they're learning to walk. They're learning to see like the first one to eight weeks is really important. They have to be by their, uh, they have to be by their mom and with a litter if, you know, if they have the opportunity to be so. Because um, that's when they, like, learn their first social, uh, like, their, their social conditioning comes. Oh, my God. Look at her ear. Oh, stop. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. That's too much. That's too much. She's not even trying. That's the crazy thing. She's not even fucking trying. She's just the cutest little thing. Um, but yeah, they, they learn. It's very formative. They start seeing things like and reacting to light and whatnot by, I think, like four weeks, five weeks. So she's only a couple weeks removed from like literally being able to see things and getting off the teat by eight uh, and then start being able to, you know, eat hard foods. Uh, by eight. So I got her like a, like a all ages, uh, appropriate for puppy, like kibble. That is, uh, very, um, that is like a uh, very soft. Um, but yeah, we, I have, I have a bunch of name suggestions. We're going to get to that first, but I'm trying to, I'm trying to fucking set the vibe. Are they stubborn eaters? So from what I understand, uh, she just eats when she wants and will sometimes skip a meal or whatever. Uh, she's not like, she's not like weird at all. I mean, she, she ate dogs should not eat kibble. Well, this ain't your average kibble. Okay. So don't worry. And also, um, you know, it just, just trust me. Okay. First of all, dogs can eat fucking kibble. You're wrong. And secondly, it's not literally like Purina fucking half pigeon meat shit. Okay. So, I mean, this little baby's eating, uh, this little baby's eating some, some fine dining. Okay. Some decadent ass shit. Never dreaming that I would uh, still be in this, still breeding, living full time with the dogs. Uh, Timeline's a bit off. Eyes open by two weeks, soft food, four weeks walking. 
Six weeks weaning, six to eight weeks socializing with siblings and detachment from mother. Source, raised golden retrievers for 20 plus years. Showing, judging around the world. I mean, it's been a life-changing experience. It's winter time here, beginning of February. So we have the nursery. Solita, where's your babies? Oh. We got a little little group she woke of up uh, the whistle. pups here that are five weeks old here with mom. Bro, she's reacting way better than me. She's reacting way harder than me. She's reacting in ways that I never could, okay? When people say, when people say like, react harder, this is why. I got a puppy so she could be my co-reactor uh, and, and react way harder than me than I ever could. Sort of learning how to be outside, getting socialized to the... Come on, pups. Come on, babies, let's go. Who's over here? The rest of them are sleeping right now, so we'll just have to take those two. I mean, they. She looks pretty similar to that, which is why I'm thinking like so maybe we'll maybe she two. is a. Uh... Then my facility here, my three car garage, is my kennel building. All the dogs sleep in here at night. All the grooming, feeding, everything goes on in here. They she doesn't are from have that the eyebrow world, thing. What do you mean? Tibet. Oh, like the little uh, white patches she does. Look. She has like the double patch above her eyebrows. We're going to do a doggy DNA anyway, but look, look. Isolated region, both in geography and climate, in the religion and tradition of the people. And because of that, they bred true for centuries, isolated in this sort of cold mountain kingdom, uh, performing a function as a family and flock guardian. She fell, bro. She fucking fell. That's crazy. She will get up. She's so fucking goofy. She will sometimes get up and just straight up fucking fall immediately back down. Like while she's sleeping, it's nuts. How is this a real thing, dude? I don't understand. We do not deserve dogs. Look at those little fucking legs, dude. Look at those goddamn legs. Look at those goddamn fucking paws, dude. Look at that. Oh. So soft, too. But yeah, I mean, her paws aren't that big, so maybe, I don't know. I, I feel like her paws aren't that big, for the record. Um, so maybe she's, uh, maybe she's mixed. Typically, you'd have a like, dog. I mean, I know she's mixed with something, but like maybe she's mixed with something that's not that big. Living with nomads or living at a, in a courtyard in the city, uh, protecting the family. Uh, maintaining the, the safety of the home, of the children, of the flock of sheep from wolves, uh, whatever, whatever their charge may be, sort of evolving as a dual purpose, as a stationary guard dog, uh, much like some of the other Mastiff breeds, and also as a flock guardian, uh, like the Kuvas, like the Great Pyrenees. So sort of the uh, amalgamation of a Mastiff breed and a mountain guardian breed. A naturally evolved land race breed that uh, sort of bred true and evolved very specifically because of the, the isolation and the geography and the climate of Tibet. Uh, there wasn't much coming in or going out. It really was, uh, you know, the mountain villages, uh, the snow-capped mountains, the mountain passes, uh, the low-laying valleys, and uh, the dogs were... Well, this shirt is out of control. I... All the other, all the other like massive stuff is so crazy that I didn't even notice. Like, what the fuck is going on with these patterns? Isolated there, and like the other Tibetan breeds, which include the Spaniel and the Terrier, um, they really uh, didn't have much option to to crossbreed. They sort of developed a very pure race of dogs. In that evolution of the breed. Um, there were different functions. You, uh, you have history documenting uh, the traditional mastiff type, the very large, heavy, uh, more pendulous lips, more hanging skin, sizable, uh, stationary guardian. Um, these dogs would be seen at the monasteries, uh, chained up in front, often in the courtyards uh, of the- Like pendulous lips, as in like mastiff breeds, 
uh, globally will always have like incredibly droopy fucking lips. Um, that is because they're war dogs originally. All mastiff breeds are bred for, uh, you know, defense and for war. So they have like these crazy jowls and they have a lot of extra skin. And the reason for why they have that is so they don't actually, if they get like stabbed or if they uh, get bit by like a wolf or whatever, they don't actually feel it and they can continue fighting. Like they literally, that's, that's why they have like so much loose skin. You're like, what the fuck is the reason for this? But the reason is because like they are, it's like defensive. It's like chain mail. It's like having chain mail on your on your skin, basically. Yeah, plus 100 defense. The wealthier armored. people in the cities of Tibet, um, whereas a, uh, a more athletic... What makes a dog breed pure? Dude, I don't fucking know. I don't give a shit about any of this stuff. I'm just looking at this because, like, this guy very clearly knows about the history of this breed. But, I mean, I think it's incest for the most part, right? It's just, like... They, they literally will incestuously fucking breed certain traits for years and years and years with the hopes that, like, they end up uh, getting these, like, designer traits. But, I mean, what we're talking about with, like, this type of breed on, like, fucking French Bulldogs or whatever is that a lot of these breeds are... are a lot of these breeds are bred for a thousand fucking years already, so it doesn't even matter at that point. Like... Which is why they, like, like the Inu family of dogs are dogs that have been bred for, like, thousands of years. So, at that point, it doesn't, it doesn't even matter. You know what I mean? Like, they're very healthy. Whereas, um, whereas like, designer dogs that are bred to be, like, small and, like, have that busted-ass nose and shit, uh, those dogs will have a lot of health complications. Like, literally, similar to, like, human uh, like dogs that are bred for aesthetic reasons and for like consumer uh, choices, like designer dogs will usually have like really busted ass shit. Like they can't breathe. Uh, they have a lot of like snout problems. They end up having cancer, shit like that. Whereas aren't all Inus literally from like four families because of World War II? I did not know that, but Whereas, like, uh, dogs that were bred for, you know, guardianship, dogs that were bred for hunting, uh, and, and, and dogs like that, they are uh, dogs that have been bred for, like, thousands of years for a particular purpose, don't actually get, uh, don't actually have that many uh, complications. Leaner, perhaps even a little meaner, more guardian type, would be moving with the nomads, would be a little more efficient in its physiology, not quite as heavy. Um, perhaps a little more confrontational with predators. And so you have this duality, and very often the two types would be regularly crossed uh, to, to maintain the guardian ability and the physical. I love that. Why is this guy a mix of Tiger King and Papa John? Literally a correct assessment. ability of the nomadic type, along with the size and the presence and the type and the, the heft that came along with the Mastiff type. So that's still uh, still manifested in today's dog and the subject of tremendous controversy within the breed because you have people that are attracted to the breed for one type or the other and there's many who sort of uh, blend the types to, uh, to maintain that same balance that was achieved in Tibet. The, the term Tibetan Mastiff was only applied once Westerners discovered the breed uh, a couple centuries ago uh, because it was the, the massive breed of Tibet. The old word for massive is Mastiff. So it was known as the Mastiff of Tibet, the great dog of Tibet. I can't tell if he's like making this part up, but he seems so confident that like, I'm just, I'm just going with it. But it also, doesn't that literally sound like something that uh, someone would make up? Like, it just sounds like it sounds fake. It's probably not. Because, like, this guy knows what he's talking about, clearly. Nobody, nobody puts that shirt on. Nobody puts that shirt on when they wake up in the morning to talk about fucking anything that is their specialty without having the confidence of knowing every little thing about this breed. You know what I mean? Like, 
Like this man put this Dan Flash's ass shirt on because he was like, "I'm this is my this is my Mastiff talking shirt." Okay, I know, I know what the fuck is good. I don't give a fuck what I'm wearing. No man bears the weight of that shirt without knowing exactly. <laughs> Mastiff in Old Tibetan means suck tongue. That uh, in in their native land they were known as the Doki. Doki meaning tied dog or guard dog. Um, as they, they, they are one of the original breeds from which many of our present day working dogs descend. Uh, certainly the flock guardian breeds, also the St. Bernard, uh, the Chow Chow. Um, there is- Bro, these things are so funny looking, but apparently they're so aggressive. Like I had no idea. Like I thought that these, these things were so fucking cute. And then uh, I found out that they are one of the most aggressive fucking breeds. Like, they're like Dalmatians. Dalmatians are also apparently very aggressive. Like, you think, you would think that they'd be like cute as fuck. And like, you know, you got the 101 Dalmatians. Like, you, you, you think that they are like, you know, beautiful, wonderful dogs. You have them at the fucking... Uh, you know, in the old days, like, the meme was that, like, every fire department had a Dalmatian, that sort of shit. No, man. They are fucking aggro as hell. My grandparents had one growing up, so we could never go over there. And then, of course, they got a Dalmatian who was a holy terror because they never got him properly trained. Yeah. Speculation, various theories. My neighbors had a chow chow, and I thought that thing was going to break the fence and kill me eventually. Okay, I'm going to be honest with you. Guys, like, you can't get owned by a chow chow. They are not that big, okay? You could just kick the fucking thing. Like, also, Mastiff apparently means tamed from Old French, uh, and then from Latin, he's lying. Theories of if the actual Mastiff breeds came from them or if they evolved simultaneously because of the geography and the isolation, uh, it, it really bred a dog that was uh, very adept at protection in high altitude and cold climates. You're talking about a, a geography from 8 to 10 to 15,000 feet, uh, even higher. Uh, it was a dog that had a very heavy coat, uh, that had a slower metabolism so it could survive on less. Uh, it was a stationary guard that would be tied during the this guy is literally the average homosexual dog breeder and exhibitor in America. Source, I show dogs, and this type of people are everywhere, lol, shirt and all. <laughs> it's Today, funny. it would be let loose at night, um, and it was an independent thinker. So Bro, this fucking dog looks like a people, lion. Not with people. Like, straight uh, up. A very, a very important distinction for people today who are looking for a guardian breed. This is a dog that thinks on its own, that's an instinctive guardian, uh, that's not a, a trained guardian like a Doberman or a Rottweiler or a German Shepherd would be. This dog says, point me in the direction, show me what you want me to guard, now go to bed and let me do it. And uh, that's what they were prized for in Tibet uh, all night long. For those of you saying this is a less uh, redneck version of Joey, uh, Joe Exotic, yes, this is Joe Exotic in California. He's a California guy, okay? He will mention it, or he did mention it in the video already. This is the Joe Exotic of California, 100%. Same vibes, but just California coded, so like a little bit more liberal. Long, barking, sounding the alarm, keeping the predators away, letting everybody know that they were on guard and no one should come there. And that remains true today. If I leave my dogs out all night long, they will sound the alarm all night long. They're not barking at anything. They're sort of saying, hear ye, hear ye, all is well, stay away, don't come here, don't mess with me. And then once the sun comes up, they basically sleep for the day. I live in the high desert mountains uh, of Southern California at about 4,000 feet. Yeah, there you there go. There are predators here. Um, uh, there are birds. Are you going to keep his coat long like a lion? Her coat? <coughs> Probably not. <coughs> I want to make sure that she's like comfy first. I don't give a shit about like. Of prey. Um, I have to keep some of my puppy runs covered, especially when the pups are young, because there's big owls, there's hawks. Have you seen what a Caucasian shepherd puppy looks like? The markings are pretty similar. Brother. Of course I know what a Caucasian Shepherd puppy looks like. I'm literally fucking Turkish. Where do you think the Caucasian Shepherds come from?
Like, the fuck? Those are... Those are like, this is literally like uh, Kongal, Caucasian Shepherd. Like, these are all fucking breeds that are, um, like, they are, they are like the Caucasus region. So, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Russia. The Caucasus, man. The Caucasus isn't Turkey. I know, but like, this breed, the Caucasian Shepherd, is literally the identical breed to Kongals. Like, they're very similar to Kongal. The Kongal is more lab-like than a Caucasian Shepherd. The Caucasian Shepherd is, like, specifically has, like, a longer coat, but they're very similar. And it's from that area here. This is a Caucasian Shepherd. And no, you know why I know she's not a Caucasian Shepherd? Look at her tail. Caucasian Shepherds have a tail that goes down and sloops like that. She has a tail that swirls up. So, no. Tibetan Mastiffs uh, will have a tail that, like, uh, goes up and swirls up. Um... And I think her face is shorter, too. Caucasian Shepherds have, like, more uh, elongated uh, nose, looking more wolf-like, whereas um, she has not, like, a very long nose, as you can see from here. Never have a long-haired dog shaved? Wait, why? Never shave her, please. Definitely don't shave her. Shaving a long hair is a big no-no. Please never do that. Wait, what? Bro, I haven't even groomed this dog yet, and motherfuckers are already, like, upset. It ruins their coats? I don't even know, but... I won't do anything without asking, a consulting a professional, okay? I haven't seen any eagles, but um, I do know that a neighbor lost a young pup to a, you know, what we think was a big barn owl. Um, there are packs of coyotes that are just outside my property at night. They don't come here because, you know, there's what other the places. Fuck? There's nothing. Bro, this thing is, is devastating. This thing looks lethal, dog. Just full black. You don't see this thing at night, dude. Here for them to eat. And you just see the eyes. You, eh, oh, here's one thing I did learn about Tibet Massives. Uh, they are very agile and they're very quiet. Like, for 150 fucking pounds, they're incredibly quiet. <laughs> and so they will, like, run up to you, run up behind you without you fucking realizing, and then bark. There's a whole lot of trouble if they do come here. Well, in Tibet, um, you, you know, especially with the nomadic lifestyle, you had, uh, you had herdsmen with horses, with goats, with sheep, um, and they're the two main predators uh, in Tibet would have been the Tibetan wolf and as well as the snow leopard. And the first uh, female that I got back in 1979, um, her father was 11 years old, a dog named Kalu, the very first dog registered in the United States. Kalu uh, had a very hoarse sounding bark from an encounter with a snow leopard where his vocal box was punctured and so he what sort of had fuck? a horse uh, sounding bark all of his life from that encounter. Bro, this motherfucker got a dog. The first dog that he brought into the country was a dog that fought a snow leopard and survived. That is bananas, dude. The physical appearance of the Tibetan Look mastiff at this is sort of thing. like the same purpose as a lion in Africa. Uh, with the big mane, it's sort of that king of the beast. And in the animal kingdom, the bigger the appearance, the bigger they puff themselves up, uh, the more intimidating they are. So the, the mane uh, served a dual purpose. Well, actually more purposes. It was Did insulation. Uh, it also served uh, to make the dogs appear larger and more fierce. And it also was a barrier with the loose skin. If a predator did get a hold uh, in a battle, the Tibetan Mastiff would have an advantage because there was a lot of loose skin and a lot of hair so that they uh, had a little extra protection. Add to that the traditional red yak collar called the Kikor that they often put on the Tibetan Mastiff both to be able to identify them at distance and to distinguish them from the wolf and also for ceremonial purposes but also uh, that 
that Tibetan collar gave them a lot of insula additional insulation, sort of like a spike collar would be used on some of the bully breeds. You know, this dog has been sort of classified as one of the flock guardian breeds. Uh, I would say it's more ancestral to the flock guardian breeds. Uh, for example, I, I do get people often who call me uh, saying, you know, uh, you know, I've got a flock of sheep, or I've got a wolf problem, or I've got, you know. To be honest, very often I refer them to a different breed. The Tibetan Mastiff is what I'd call a sort of a home or a ranch or a farm protector. They are more involved with people than some of the other livestock breeds who would just as soon be with the sheep as ever see another person. Uh, the Tibetan Mastiff wants to touch base with the people, with the home, oversee the the corrals, oversee the fields, oversee the whole thing, and to and but to remain around the home and the family. They're not a, a breed that excels at, for example, being raised with the flock, like you would see with the Great Pyrenees or a Kuvas or even one of the Avcharka breeds. Um, you know, if you have a wolf or predator problem. I'd suggest going to another breed. Uh, if you've got a big ranch or a farm or some livestock that you want an overseer who's going to sort of be the foreman and oversee the whole thing, uh, the Tibetan Mastiff is the right breed. I've been involved with the breed since 1978 and I have to say that it, it has gone to places I never imagined. Uh, for the first 20 Everybody fucking calm down. I had the I I the the camera's propped next to the goddamn mini fridge, okay? So yes, when I move the mini fridge, the camera moves a little bit. <clears throat> 10,000% didn't expect to be learning about an actual insane amount of a specific dog, but here I am. It's going to be really funny when I do the DNA test and we find out that like she's not even 1% Tibetan Mastiff. While I'm over here learning so much about this fucking breed, which, I mean, it doesn't matter. I love her, and she's incredible, but. I don't give a shit about um, what breed she is. She's fucking awesome. Yeah. And uh, hopefully she will grow to be very large. I bought a dog that's said to be a hound. It got tested. It was 1% bloodhound mix. Going to be like a white person claiming native ancestry. Yeah, but like I don't, it's a dog and I don't care. You know what I mean? I like, I love her already. Many years, we sort of struggled to get new bloodlines in, to get any sort of support, to get recognition for people to know what the breed was. Uh, it wasn't until 2005 that the breed went into the AKC miscellaneous group, and it was fully recognized just 10 years ago in 2007. Um, I was a part of the committee that helped to draft the standard. Uh, for AKC recognition, and I've been involved with it all along. Um, the breed started out with very few imports coming in uh, out of some of the outlying areas because Tibet was closed. Tibet was behind the red curtain of China. Uh, it wasn't until the last maybe 10 years that Tibet has really opened up to visitors. We've been able to see what's in there. Uh, China became a big player in the breed, uh, much to my surprise and everyone else's surprise. Um, probably around 2004, 2005, uh, suddenly there were hundreds of examples of the breed in China, seemingly out of nowhere. Well, what we didn't realize was that, you know, during that 50, 60 year period when Tibet and China were closed, a lot of the dogs were still there and reproducing uh, in the Tibetan regions and some of the southern regions of China with the Tibetan populations that were there. And it was a uh, sort of a shock to the Tibetan Mastiff world, but at the same time, very encouraging because suddenly here were a lot of new bloodlines that were available. So the breed was no longer in danger of extinction, no longer had to rely on uh, 
maybe substandard examples with more or less Tibetan Mastiff blood from India, Bhutan, Nepal, all the outlying areas where the dogs were first exported uh, to Europe and the United States in the 1970s and 80s. I love her so, so much. So this was this you has been no a idea. real boost for for the breed, which now uh, has really legitimately reclaimed its position in the dog world. Hey, come on in and meet the puppies. Hey, pup, pup. What's going on? Hey, you guys. You don't get a wet nose on the lens. They say, what have you got? You must have a treat for us. <laughs> this boy here is probably staying with us since he's already been named. This girl's going to Norway next week and this boy is probably going to Mexico. Look, you, do you see their tails? They droop up words like that. Usually if, if, they're, if they're staying in the US, they can leave at eight, nine weeks. Uh, usually, usually nine to 10 weeks if they're gonna be shipped. They're gonna be picked up eight to nine weeks. If they're going overseas, they've gotta be vaccinated to three months with rabies and then wait 30 days before they go. So that's why these big puppies are here. <laughs> Because the breed evolved naturally in Tibet, uh, Mother Nature is sort of the harshest of breeders. Um, you know, if a dog was not healthy, could not survive and thrive to reproduce, it often didn't. So, uh, I love how chunky this dude is. I mean, she's a chunky girl or a chunky boy, but he's also a chunky guy running alongside um, her. As a breed, it is a relatively healthy breed. Give her a snow pile one day, please be the greatest content ever. Oh yeah, no, don't worry. I, I want to try and travel with her. Um, I, I definitely want to try and travel with her before uh, she gets too big. But I do want to do that. I definitely want her to, like, uh, you know, experience snow and the light. As a result of that land race evolution and Mother Nature, um, you do see some of the same issues you see in other breeds, but not to the same degree. Um, you know, we have... From what I understand, these dogs have hip dysplasia, like they can have front leg issues or back leg problems and eye sight issues because their eyes are so droopy. A very low incidence of hip or elbow dysplasia, uh, very few eye problems. Uh, older dogs uh, will die of a cancer or a heart problem or some sort of glandular problem or... No, I didn't pre-watch. I only watched it up to like here, but the rest of it, I just, I read a lot. There, there's nothing that is a breed-wide problem like you see in other breeds. Um, and it's a healthier breed, especially for a larger breed. They do go 11 to 14 years. Um, you know, some of the first dogs may go at nine or 10 years from, from a cancer or uh, some other, you know, ailment. But you'll also have some of uh, the, I've heard of dogs 15 and 16 years of age living, you know, sort of pampered dogs that have had the advantage of Western food and medicine and care. I've been fortunate enough to become a judge for the breed because of my experience in all the years. And um, the breed standard is very clear about what makes an ideal Tibetan Mastiff. Uh, it needs to be a large, imposing dog. And uh, when I say large, it's not a giant breed. As some of the giant breeds go, there are dogs that are much taller and dogs that are much heavier. But this is a very large, imposing breed, and that size is amplified by the coat. Uh, you get a, an older male in a colder climate that's a large dog, that coat's going to make him look 50 pounds heavier. You know, sometimes, um, you know, my big males that you saw today... Your house is going to be so full of hair. No, man. They have two different coats of hair. They have, like, human-style hair, and then they have regular fur. So the regular fur sheds and, and when it sheds twice a year, apparently maximum, but then that's it. You're like fine with uh, weekly grooming. They all range between 130 and 150 pounds. Like, dude, this guy is fucking terrifying. This is like a, this is an imposing presence. Dude. But people a, will this... say, oh, wow, that dog must be 200 pounds just because it has such an imposing look, which helped a lot with their function in Tibet. Uh, you look for a very natural dog, not anything overdone. It's got to be balanced because you want to 
keep in mind what the breed was used for in Tibet. It had to survive in very extreme conditions. It had to be an athlete. So you have a balance of muscle, of power, of bone structure, of sizable head, of harsh coat. Um, all those things evolved to help it perform its function and to survive in the uh, extreme environment. And those things are still maintained and prized today. When understanding the temperament of the Tibetan Mastiff, first and foremost, you have to realize that it is a dog that evolved to work instead of people, not with people. So I describe that as maybe about 20% cat. It's a breed that's smart, one of the smartest breeds, but it's more intuitive intelligence, not behavioral intelligence. You know, you throw a dog, you throw a, a, a ball for a Tibetan Mastiff, second time it's gonna go, you threw it, you go get it. Either that or I'm gonna get it or chew it up. Another family group I have here, I have- We'll see about that. I don't like that as far as uh, dogs goes. I saw I'm a cat dog. Okay, first of all, guys, it, it the the way that the way that these things work oftentimes you know uh dog qualities are compared to cats when uh you want to talk about the personality of a dog and how how intelligent the dog is or how independent the dog is and it's the exact opposite for cats cats will also a cat cats will also be compared to dogs specific breeds of cats when the cat is like um more loving more kind more polite you know just like qualities that you would want it's normal I have a four-year-old dolly dolly is a daughter of my big boy leo who you met earlier Nice solid black color, which is the original dominant color in the breed. Then I have Dino, who uh, one of my stud dogs. He's just come back from doing some stud work, so he's a little lean right now. But he's making up for it by uh, eating double. Hey, Dino. Hey, girls. Talia. Then this red girl is Talia. She's one year old. She's uh, going to be sort of my future show prospect. She and Bravo are half brother, half sister, and uh, she just got that little show spark. Talia, come on, Talia, Gaia, come on, Gaia. He's also training. He's also talking about purebreds. If your dog is mixed, anything can happen. Yeah, one hundred percent. The light gold girl here is Gaia. 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 Guy is a year old also. Um, I did a breeder trade. One of my friends, uh, Himat Singh from India, he, uh, he has uh, some dogs that are sort of distantly related to mine. We traded puppies She's this dreaming. year. It's sort of a way that breeders keep uh, some genetic diversity. Oh my and, God. Uh, oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. She's so fucking cute. I'm going to die. While being able to maintain the integrity of the breed and the top quality Gaia come here Gaia come on come on oh, oh, oh. she woke up with the whistles oh no go back go back to sleep go back to sleep yeah good job good girl come on over here Gaia come on Gaia come on Gaia come on Dolly you know you you notice when we were out in the yard with my dogs you know, I call them three, four, five times. They acknowledge that I'm calling them, but they're like, I know you're going to put me back. I've got other things I need to do. I need to check the boundaries. Uh -oh. I need to pee on everything. I've got a higher calling. So the, the temperament is stable. Um, they're not necessarily a one person dog. They're more of a one family, a one yard, a one flock dog. They want to belong. They want to know what am I supposed to protect? How are things supposed to be? What's the status quo? Who's allowed? Who's not? And point me in the direction and I'll do it. And let me do it by myself. They should be much more of a guard on their home turf, whether it's with the flock of I wanted her to, I, I, every time she wakes up, I immediately put her on the pad because like I want her to, because you know, you never know when she's going to poop, right? But she's such a little baby. She's like way too young to be like properly potty trained obviously these are like the beginning stages of potty training 
Um, eventually I'll start potty training her by, um, by taking her outside. But, um, at this stage, she's, like I said, she's too young. So she doesn't even get it. So she just lays down on the fucking pad. Oh my gosh. She's playing with the toys. Oh, this is what a treat. What a treat that is. Little yawn, wake up from the nap, and then play with the toys a little bit. Dying. There you go. Enhanced sheep the chickens the the kids in the yard or just you know their basic neighborhood backyard uh, they should be a guardian there when you take them off the property whether it's to the park to a dog show whatever they're much more relaxed because uh, you know it's like well okay I'm off duty here I guess I can enjoy wherever we are um, they're not a dog for example that you could tell to attack a stranger when you're off property. Again, they are a defender, but not an aggressor. You don't see them going out, causing trouble. Why the fuck would anybody want to do that, by the way? You got to be a real freak to be like, yo, go out and attack someone. But I guess that's like, you know, people that get like Belgian Malinois, you know what I mean? Where they're like, they want to, they want like a military style dog. They're like, this is not a cop dog is uh, what he's saying. He's saying this is not an American coded dog. Looking for trouble, but they stand their ground and say, don't cross this line. You know, if you've got other breeds, get the dog as a puppy and raise them with those other breeds so that they establish their order. They're very reliable with other animals. Um, I always recommend that they have a canine companion just because they relate to another dog differently than they do to a person. I do recommend for the average owner who's got a yard and a family to have an opposite sex companion so if you want that big male puppy because you just love the breed and want a big male then get an opposite sex get a either a tibetan mastiff female as a companion or you know a labrador female or something more sizable a large mixed breed malibute uh, something that is large enough to interact and exercise with the tibetan mastiff because uh you know they're a, a physical breed and yeah good thing i have uh, a lot of uh, a lot of friends with dogs that are that size oh wait just kidding the fuck i got fiona who's like a tiny little baby uh we got mika who is also a tiny little baby mika is like both mika and fiona are the size of this puppy right now like pretty much they're like a little bit larger um uh Myung has nobby which is uh the size of a chicken small much smaller than a chicken actually what am i talking about the size of a chick Farley is already much smaller than this dog. Um, wait, Fiona isn't big? I mean, to me, she doesn't seem that big. She's bigger than Mika, but... And no, Fiona has not met the puppy yet. No one has met the puppy because I'm, I'm keeping her away from other dogs for the time being because I want to make sure that, uh, you know, she's fine. Like, she hasn't been vaccinated yet. Oh, she's playing with the other toy now. She got so many toys. Got so many fucking toys, dude. This this dog is so fucking spoiled, dude. But she deserves the world. They enjoy roughhousing and and having a buddy. Um, you know, a nice sizable yard for the dogs to run in and play in. Um, they're not a good apartment or condo dog at all. Uh, they are not particularly good in hot, humid climates. They can take heat as long as they have shade and cold water. They can take wet and cold, but uh, it's the combination of heat and humidity that is exactly opposite of the cold, arid, dry climate of Tibet that really is a problem for their coat, ear infection. Yeah, uh, California is dry heat, so at least it's not like humid. That's a big one, but ultimately it doesn't even matter because, uh, you know, you can be indoors all day during the day. And if I, you know, let her loose outside, it's going to be at night. So 
infections, skin infections, uh, lethargy, uh, not thriving, shortened lifespan if they're, if they're in a tropical climate. Uh, the type of home I look for is, first and foremost, someone with large dog experience. This is not a starter breed. This is an extremely intelligent breed that will be running you if you don't run them. They need an alpha owner who has large breed experience. Uh, they need a good size yard. It doesn't have to be a large yard. It can be a normal uh, suburb yard. Uh, six foot fencing minimum. Um, you want to make sure it's sturdy. Uh, because, you know, they're, they're a powerful breed. They can go over, under, around, and through just about any fence. You, you want a family that, that knows and appreciates a large breed, an independent breed, and who can stay a step ahead of them uh, because the Tibetan Mastiff wants boundaries. Once you give it that boundary, it's a great dog, and it's not going to be a problem. You're going to have to call Murad a lot to discipline this dog? Are you fucking kidding me? Dude, I had a big breed. I had a big pit bull. I know how to fucking discipline a dog. Uh, Murad, on the other hand, is a fucking baby, okay? <clears throat> I mean, I think he did a really good job of, of training Fiona, but... Problematic dog with behavior. But you want to socialize it early, um, socialize it to the people and places you expect it to go, and, um, you know, then it will, it will uh, thrive thrive in that environment that, that, that makes up your life. Some people say, why this breed? Why did you get involved? I liked something that was rare, something that was exotic. Uh, I wanted a place that I could make a difference. And there was only about 100 dogs, 100 Tibetan Mastiffs in the United States when I got involved in 1978. Um, what makes me stay with the breed? They're, they're, they're such individuals. They have such character. Um, they really are sort of an ultimate companion. Um, you know, I like the fact that they're independent. I like that they've got their own mind and do their own thing. Uh, you know, I can rely on the fact that they're independent, and I like that. They're, 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 they're not going to behave the oh. way I want them to necessarily, oh. but I oh. appreciate the, the character and the personality that they have. And for an individual or a family that wants a very loyal and reliable, large, healthy breed that has some experience that lives in She's a looking up at me uh, like what the fuck's this guy moderate doing? Moderate to colder climate, preferably. Um, this this can really be a, a special dog. But this is a large breed. It's 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 something that requires um, a large car, a large crate. Uh, Larger bags of food. Everything is, is big sized. It's not like having a small companion dog that sleeps on the couch. Um, they're going to want to be an indoor and outdoor dog. They're going to want to know what's going on. They're not a dog to be left in the house when you leave. They're a dog that should be outside to guard the place because if not, they're going to go through the screen or the door or the window to get out if there's a threat and you're not home to let them out. So it's just consider the, the strength, the character, um, and the personality of the breed, and if it if it's what you're looking for, it can be a fantastic dog. Um, but you have to, you know, choose the right dog for the right situation, and be sure you're you're the right owner. Bro, she's fucking sleeping all day because she literally did not sleep at night. Okay. It's crazy to me that this demon slept all day. What is this all about living with Tibetan Mastiffs? Documentary TV? There's more? What the fuck? Safe. They can be a good pet if you're well prepared for uh, a dog. Okay, well, there's a lot of documentaries on this dog, but I think we got enough, okay? Um... I think we've seen enough. I think it's now time to name her. Now that you got like the vibes a little bit, um, I'm not going to do the DNA test yet because she's like very clearly not awake. I mean, I guess we could. I don't know how long it... Bro picked a weird fixation. Um, I guess we could try the DNA test. I just don't know how it works, okay? Here's the DNA test. This is some fucking Embark shit. I don't know. Um, the 
veterinarian developed dog DNA test. Not an ad, by the way. You get it out and it's got this like cool, you know, gene looking uh, aesthetic. And behind it, it says, Embark, thank you for joining family, scientists, and veterinarians around the world working to combat preventable diseases in dogs. I guess they're working to combat preventable diseases in dogs. The world leader in canine genetics. Unleash your dog's story. Okay, so first you got to go and activate it, which I have a unique uh, code to activate with. Hold on one second. I'm going to do that real quick. Okay. One moment while I do that. Please don't call her Rizzo. That's the name of the mistress that ripped my family apart. <clears throat> Embarkvet.com. Activate. Okay. Let's do it. I, um, I have to create an account immediately. Okay. Okay. You consent to your dog's story being shared? No. What's your dog's name? Oh, shit. We got to fucking do the dog's name first. Um, fuck, should we do the name first, I guess? 